I don't want to just survive. I want to truly live. Breathe. I could ask you to dance. And you could say, well, I don't feel like dancing. And then I could say, well, maybe some other time. <laughs> or I could just not ask. <laughs> Diana, this is your future life we're talking about. You hardly know him. He's practically a stranger. The thing is, I just know this is it. I love you, Robin. <sighs> I'm not feeling too good. I can't move. What's going on? Robin, get him on a respirator. People paralyzed by polio don't last long. Can't move anything from the neck down. Can't even breathe for yourself. How do you live like this? Yes, you, Stuart. I love you, and I want Jonathan to know you. You can't love this. Yes, I can. There must be something I can do. Get me out of here. Robin's going to leave the hospital. No one with your husband's disability exists outside a hospital. Why has anyone ever tried? Robin! Robin! You're right, Danny. Much better. <sighs> Five pounds says you'll never make it. You're on. Darling, call Teddy. I've had an idea. A wheelchair that does his breathing for him. Are you sure it's safe? Yeah, no. It's worked so far. Alan. You owe me five pounds. Yummy bastard. Why do you keep your disabled people in prison? No one's believed it's possible to live as you do. Well, we should open the gates and set them free. Bloody virus. What now, Robin, a world tour? Wouldn't that be an adventure? When I first became paralyzed, I wanted to die. My wife told me I had to live. <laughs> See how our son grow up. Your life is my life. I don't want to just survive. I want to truly live. I think he should be in hospital. No? You're quite right. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome to tonight's screening. God, I want to see more movies like this. Movies that are just creative for the sake of being creative and free. Great films, they leave me feeling a little more alive and connected, and they remind me to laugh and hope and hurt and feel. I just want to tell great stories, and I want to tell different stories. We don't only have to tell one type of story. Well, good morning. My name is Eric Kohanek, and I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the uh, press conference for Breathe, uh, an emotion-filled journey that tells the tale of uh, Robin and Diana Cavendish, who were a very strong couple that underwent uh, huge challenges because of a disastrous disease. Um, Breathe was a, is a TIFF gala presentation. It had its world premiere last night at the Roy Thompson Hall. And there is another public screening going on right as we speak. With me today, seated next to me, is Andy Serkis, who's the director of the film. Next to Andy is uh, Andrew Garfield, who, of course, plays Robin Cavendish in the uh, film. 
Next to Andrew, we have Claire Foy, who plays Diana Cavendish, Robin's wife. And last but certainly not least, we have Jonathan Cavendish, who's the producer of the film and whose real life parents are the subject matter of the film. Welcome, uh, welcome to Toronto. Welcome to the film festival. It's Thank your first you. time here. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. What an amazing place. If you have any questions, please stick up your hands. We'll get a microphone over to you. In the meantime, I'll uh, I'll start things off, and uh, and actually I'll start off with Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, um, at what point did you realize that your parents' story was one that needed to be told on on the screen? Well, as a film producer, you're always looking for stories, and. Uh, I don't know, one day about 15 years ago, I woke up and went, hmm, that's interesting. My parents, that's a good story. Uh, and I, at about that time, I saw a play uh, by uh, a writer called Bill Nicholson called Shadowlands, which I loved. And I thought this is the tone that I would like if I was to make a film about my parents. And I met Bill, who I was working with on a film called Elizabeth the Golden Age. And I, I asked him if he would write the story. I told him the story. And uh, he said, I will, I'd love to write, it's an amazing story, but only if you don't pay me. So I went, okay, that's good, I like that. Um, uh, uh, so we, we have now paid him, I should say, uh, since the film has actually happened. But it meant that we could develop it over a very long time. Um, and then when Andy and I became business partners in our company, The Imaginarium, I gave the script to him, he liked it, and so we then continued to develop it together. But the film was never going to happen until we found the critical ingredients who are sitting on my right. Of course, and uh, uh, Andy, how much did you know about this story before, uh, did you know anything about it before you uh, were approached to be part of it? No, not at all. Um, I, I knew nothing of it. It's lovely being described as an, an ingredient though. <laughs> no, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, it, 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 no, n nothing at all. I, I was sent the script and I, I, I read it and I just cried constantly and laughed a lot and cried more and then laughed more. Mostly more laughter than crying, but a lot of crying. So that was like loads of laughter. Um, and uh, it felt so strangely, you know, stranger than fiction. Um, and so strangely unique. And then I sat with Jonathan, we had a, a delightful dinner in Los Angeles and there was just a magic that I felt about the whole, the whole process um, and his, his parents' life and, 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 and his life. And, and I spoke to Andy on the phone and I, I felt so heartened that his vision was, was so heartfelt and so um, about the pioneering spirit of these two people and um, it was just one of those incredibly life-affirming stories that you can't help but be inspired by and you can't help but be changed by in some way. And Claire, how did you come into the project and, and did you do a lot of crying too? <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of crying on and off screen. Um, uh, I, I, no, I did. I, um, I hadn't, I've never read a script and, and felt that way about it and read it and had such a strong... I didn't really think about it, and a lot of the time, I don't know whether you do this, but when you're reading something, you're going, oh, oh, could I do that? Or, oh, I wonder how I'll do that, and I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. I just didn't think about anything. I didn't think about me reading it, thinking I might be in it, or how they would do it. I just read the story, um, and I mean, it was just beyond moved, really. Um, and then had a very s strange experience where Andy just asked me to do it, <laughs> and then, um, then met Andrew and... Um, yeah, it was just very, very quick. It wasn't a lot of time to think, actually. So you just had to go, yes, yes, please, yes. <laughs> Said yes a lot. Now, Andy, this is your directorial debut. And it, was it important for you to make this film uh, be your directorial de debut? Um, it, it, the, we started working on this um, in 2013, I believe it was, and then uh, and then whilst we were we were you know we did some early location scouting, and then and then Jungle Book came along actually, and so I then we then decided that it was good it would be a great opportunity for the Imaginarium Studios with the performance capture etc to, to to start working on that. So we actually shot Jungle Book in South Africa. 
Um, and then because it's such an incredibly long post-production period, which has been going on for two years, we there was a hiatus in the middle, and we had the opportunity to to re re return to this. So in fact, this is this has come this has come first. Um, it, it it I mean I I, I truly. Truly, um, I'm so thankful that it is the first film that, I, that I've made because um, it, it's such a, an incredibly vivid, brilliant, uh, vibrant and witty take on, on disaster. I was actually brought up, um, my, dad, my father was a doctor and my mother taught disabled children. So I was very, I've, I grew up with uh, kids who, who had spina bifida and polio and, uh, thalid, and were thalidomide. And it, it was very much, I, I felt very connected to, to this world. Um, and, and it just seems to me that people, people choose to respond to, to adversity in so many different ways and can cope with it and some people can't. But, but what was incredible about this story was the wit which, with which these people dealt with adversity, and, and that was what I wanted to bring to the movie. And, and as Andrew was saying, this sense of pioneering. I mean, these were incredible pioneers. They, to, to, to live outside of the hospital system with that level of disability in 1959, I have a sister who's an MS sufferer now, and getting around in a wheelchair in 2017 is pretty impossible. But to, to, to try and exist outside of the hospital system at that time, I just thought was like climbing Everest in your backyard. And that's, and that, and that's what really inspired me about this tale. All right, let's open it up to questions. We have one down here, we have a microphone. Uh, good morning, uh, Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun and Post Media News Network. Andy, you're such a romantic. And, and this is a good thing. You're not ashamed or reluctant to express things in a lyrical and romantic way, even when it's a tough subject. And I'm curious uh, how strong an urge it was for this project. It, it was absolutely the defining way I wanted to make this movie. It was never going to be a, dr a, a drama documentary. It was never going to be a, a, a sort of very dark take on something that, that is, you know, which, which affects people in such an, a negative and, and desperate ways. This was always, I mean, the essence of this movie is, is hope. The essence of this movie is love. And the essence of Robin and Diana is this incredible wit and humor. And so uh, that was reflected in every single aspect of making this film, from the beginning of the movie, which is like a fairy tale, um, you know, these two gilded young people, athletic, great, you know, their lives are gonna be incredible. They are totally in love with each other. And then and then obviously this, they get struck struck down. And it's, 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 in every choice of design, in every shot, in every every aspect of it was this vibrancy with which they continued to live life afterwards. And that's, we were making a movie, we were not making a documentary, and that, that is that is one of the most exciting things, I think, um, uh, about about the energy of what we, we all had and felt on set, was this, we were we were elevating this to, to, to tell a story, not just a literal story of survival, but a, but a metaphor for our times about love, about, about, you know, about the power of love. Andrew, last night after the screening, uh, you told the audience there that you uh, found Jonathan was a, a great life source that gave you a lot of um, material for you to, to build this character. What sort of tips did he give you, or what did he say? Um, I, don't, I, I don't want to embarrass him any more than I already have. Um, it's more his essence, I'm afraid. Sorry, dear boy. Um, <laughs> It's more just being around his essence. He's definitely his father's son and his mother's son. Um, but there's, a, there's an essence, that Cavendish essence, which uh, was so intoxicating for me, just in, in script form when I read the script and in meeting Jonathan and then meeting Diana and meeting all of the, the, the old friends. There was a, it was by osmosis, really. I think that's, that was the process. It was time spent and just opening my pores and all my senses to, you know, the, 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 the essence of his DNA, the essence of Jonathan's DNA, which um, is very lovely to be around and to absorb, you know, so. And Claire, uh, you actually got to meet Diana, I assume, uh, before you started working on this. What essence of her did struck you right away when you met her? Um, well, I was a bit scared to meet her because um, she, after reading the script, I sort of was, she became a bit of a hero in my head. Um, and, but she's exactly how she's drawn by, by Bill um, Nicholson, who wrote the script. She's just um, herself. 
She's unashamedly herself, and she won't be anyone else for anyone else, which I just find incredible. Um, and she's very, very honest and uh, truthful without being sentimental or, um, or anything like that. She just says what she thinks, and she means and means what she says, um, which I think is incredible. But also, uh, it's extraordinary to know this woman now, as she, as she is now, um, and know uh, what she was like as a young woman, and how far she's travelled in her journey of who she is, really, through her relationship with Robin and, and having to care for someone. I think... Um, you can't underestimate. I met someone yesterday actually who was saying that she cares, her mother cares for her grandmother. And I don't think you can underestimate what it's like to care for someone in that way, to be somebody's everything um, and know that, that you, they can't exist without you. Um, but she wears it incredibly lightly and just she's in, very inspirational but never would want to think that she is, I don't think. She's just great. And uh, Jonathan, you brought her to the screening last night, and she evoked the third of three standing ovations uh, in the audience. Uh, her re response to the, the film was, that was uh, fantastically good, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah, thank goodness. Uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> the screening, yes, that Andy and I were most nervous about was the screening that we had for my mother. Um, and she, she, she did love it. And we were talking actually last night about last night was the first time I think she saw it as a, you know, as a punter in a way. And she, I've only ever seen my mother cry once all in my entire life, despite everything that was going on. And that's one of the things that we wanted to put across. And actually that was when her mother gave her a kettle for the third time running at Christmas. <laughs> <coughs> that was the only time I ever saw her cry. Um, and there were quite a lot of other times and places where crying might have been more appropriate. And, and so I think what she loves about the film is that it absolutely accurately gets the way that they dealt with life. And the fact that what my mother did once my father became ill, and this was a man who had been in total control of his life, apparently, and then he lost total control of his life. And what my mother very cleverly and subtly did was gave him control back behind the scenes so that he became again, and this, remember, was the 1960s, he became again, you know, the person who s suggested where people sat for lunch. They were very social, they had a lot of friends. And he was apparently in charge. Um, and the subtlety with which she did that and made it happen and surrounded him with people, and he was an enormously charismatic and funny man. And I think what has astonished her most of all uh, is Andrew's performance, which really, you know, has brought my father back in the most extraordinary way. And about three weeks before we started filming, I had a very frightening moment in which I did realize that and Andrew was going to bring my father back. I got a phone message, uh, and I listened to it, and it was my father, and he'd been dead for 22 years. And at the end of the message, Andrew went, how was that? <laughs> <laughs> Way to freak him out. <laughs> and, Andrew, um, talk a bit about portraying somebody who's lost control of his life. What, what's it like to act with only having your face as a resource for the screen? How difficult is that, and, and how, do you, how do you master that? Well, it, I, have to, I, can, I have to answer that in, in two ways. Of, of course, as, as the character, as, as Robin, it's it's a whole host of things. It's loss. It's it's incorporating the loss of one's former connection to the world, i.e., the body, because he was a very athletic man. He was a very physical man, wasn't he? And an extrovert and a leader and a kind of um, yeah, the um, the leader of the tribe really, uh, and an, an adventurer. Um, so what happens when that primary source of communion with life with people, with the world, with nature gets taken away uh, with, with, without any control. So of course, it's a very complicated process um, that is um, uh, impossible to fathom, you know, the stages of grief um, when you lose something that you love. It's, it's, it's a loss, it's a loss of self in some way. Um, and then 
and then of course he he through through the love of of his wife and and um i think his own inner resources he uh, f- managed to find a way to live such a life of fullness and joy but as a performer as an actor i have to say i found it i found it m- very very pleasurable to to be limited it was very strange i i i thought i thought it would be dreadful and of, of course in moments it was um but but ultimately i felt very grateful that i got to have that experience for a brief period of time to to empathize as deeply as possible with with that experience what a what a gift it is to be an actor that gets to you know step in other people's shoes in that way um and increase empathy in that way but also it, there was something delightful and and strangely um enjoyable about um about having about about be being depotentized about having your power totally to having to having to surrender to your limitations and i think that was a wisdom that i think robin probably got to pretty early on with 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 diana and it enabled him to to live in a very very full full way by accepting the limitation and also not accepting the limitations within those limitations that other people were putting on to him he thought well what i know i can't control this but I know I maybe can control something else. And I thought, yeah, that's very, very beautiful. All right, we have a question in the back. Uh, Russ Nelson, Red Carpet News. Congratulations, everyone, on a beautiful piece of cinema. Um, my question is to the whole panel, but perhaps starting with Andrew. Uh, love is undeniably the most important and universal word in all language. I'm curious how the process of making this film and experiencing this story perhaps changed and redefined your uh, parameter, your definition of what that word actually means? Yeah, wow. Welcome to the press conference. Welcome to the... <laughs> Goodness, how long, how long do we have? We, uh, 30 seconds each. Um, yeah, wonderful question and a wonderful philosophical, um, endless... You know, the, the poets haven't figured that out. Um, Rumi didn't quite figure it out. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to to add much to the to the discourse. I'll give it a go though. Um, I know up, upon reading the upon it was really from reading the script it, immediately when I read the script I thought well I didn't think it was it was it was it was it was a vis- visceral feeling. It, it kind of plunges to the depths of you and and it, it shows you what's possible. It remi- it reminds you of your own capacities for that unconditioned, unconditional love. Being awake to it, because I believe it is an energy that we're either awake to or we're not. We either either allow in or we don't. Um, I don't, and I think we always get to choose it. Um, But ultimately, it's deeply mysterious. And I think that there was a very mysterious thing that seemed to happen with your parents, that, that, that it was a transcendent love. And love doesn't even do it. Love, love as a word, doesn't seem to encapsulate it. I remember the last scene of the film that we shot together, um, where um, you know Robin's about to pass away, and I, I, I was so dissatisfied with with the words. There was the, there, there were no words when I looked in Claire's eyes and Diana's eyes. There were there were no words that could do justice to the. <laughs> oh God, I might just cry in a TIFF press conference. <laughs> I don't particularly want to, um, but there were there were no. I I was I think I was even talking to you guys about it at the time. I was like, can we can we make, can we maybe some can we say something different? What is it that I actually need to say to her? What 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 can these what, what can I say that could possibly encapsulate the last however many years? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a kind of strange answer to a, a wonderful question. But I also do think, I mean, the film, it's definitely a love story of these two people, no doubt about that. But I do believe it's also a story of love in, uh, that's for everybody. I, I, I think Robin and Diana had a lovely child, and, um, and it's about that, the continuation of love, and that love, their love for each other meant they could love other people even more. Um, which I think is amazing um, that they had such s- such friends, like true true friends, and f- felt such love for them, and um, in their actions and the things they did for people and the things they did for the wider world, and um, and that I think that's um, amazing is that love isn't just you know. 
flowers and um, romantic love. It's, uh, I mean, I, in, not that I know the answer, but I do think it is love for everything and everyone. And But Andrew's right, that the idea of how on earth do you, that final, like how on earth do you um, say thank you or express your love for someone? How do you, how can, there are no words. It's just actions, isn't it? And the way that you treat people and the way that you live your life, I suppose. Go on, we all have to have a go, we all have to do it. Okay. Um, I think for me, the extraordinary thing about, about Andrew and Claire was that they, the more time they spent together in the situation of Andrew's immobility <clears throat> and Claire being my mother, they started doing the things that my parents used to do without being told what they were. And there's an extraordinary moment in the first party scene um, where it's actually Jonathan's third birthday, but Jonathan was behaving so badly that day that we had to take him out and he was asleep upstairs. Very true to life. <clears throat> he, very true to life. <laughs> very true to life. And there's a moment where Andrew looks at Claire, Robin looks at Diana, and wiggles his nose, and she comes over and literally itches his nose. And they used to do that, because my father obviously could feel, but he couldn't move, and my mother had to know at any moment what degree of discomfort or what my father was feeling. And to me, that's my understanding of love. It's about a detailed, granular assessment of what's going on with the person you're in love with at all times, even when you're asleep. You're thinking about that person and you're learning about that person. And that to me is, you know, a very, sorry, it's a bit earthbound, it's not roomy, but it's a, that's what I took from my parents' life as to be what I understood about love. Andy, did you want to chime in on this? Um, I'm fascinated by, by all of these theories. Um, I <laughs> no, I, I, I suppose you know, love, love is is a, you know, if you have any of you have children, you know, the, the concept of being with someone um, now, um, unless they like you or they you know, the, or they or you, you you post a picture up of yourself and, and it, you're validated in some way, it's quite an, a, kind of an alien thing to a young generation. And, and one of the things that 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 this the love that 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 these people have is. I don't know. It feels it feels to me potentially I mean, this, which is why I think this film is such a great metaphor. It's something to reach for. It is it is so um, it, it it's it's so it doesn't seem to exist in our world in the same way that these people were able to express it. And it it isn't it isn't romantic love. It's 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 it and it isn't duty. But these two people stayed together when they when Diana certainly could have could have gone and left and she didn't. And I think that concept of that in, in our society now is, is and, that, that, and it's empathy, really. Love is empathy for me. It's always, you know, being be able to see, to see and experience and viscerally connect with another po person's point of view. And I think that's, that's what these people did. Um, and, and have fun. And, uh, but, I, but I think, uh, yeah, I suppose what I'm getting at is, is that nowadays it's very easy to walk away. It's, we live in a throwaway world, a massively throwaway world, and these people did not, and certain relationships don't. But I think, I think culturally, we are we 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 are so alienated from each other now. Um, that 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 is why I found the power of this film so strong. The love at the centre of it is because it is a reminder that um, you know of of what true true love actually is. Andrew, you mentioned at the, at the screening last night that you and Claire built a bond very quickly. Uh, and Claire, you talked about basically having to stare in his face all the time. And, and um, what is the history of this bond? Uh, uh, or how quickly did it, did it happen? And am I right that, Andrew, you convinced Claire to take on this role? Is this, or no? Or you approached Silent, her? Wordlessly, he did. He went. <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, no. Um, Andy and Jonathan had the foresight that that myself and Claire would possibly get along, and uh, and create and create a, an authentic connection. And I, 
I believe they were right. I think we, I think we did. I, th I really, I, I really enjoy your company. <laughs> it's like a weird sort of like <laughs> acting dating agency. <laughs> um, no, I think good. I mean, really good. Um, <laughs> In general, a few things I'd change. Um, <laughs> but I'd never done anything like that before where you had to... I'd, I'd play parts where you obviously have to, you know, there's chemistry or you have to kind of um, instantly get to... That's just what you do. You have to instantly get to know people. But I'd never done anything where I, it was my whole performance or character entirely relied on Andrew, entirely. Um, if, I, if I'd have hated his guts, it would have been really hard um but no i just i just really like you yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah it, it just it felt very very easy weirdly yeah. we both just did never questioned it and um yeah we didn't i mean we didn't do even yeah anyway. no but it's a rare it's a rare thing and it's a tricky it's a it's a tricky thing to to figure out and to find uh and and and, and a, lot, a lot of the time it doesn't it doesn't work but thankfully but I, I, you know, they, they, they. I know Jonathan and Andy weren't willing to to make a mistake in 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 that department. You know, it, that was the this that is the heart and the essence of of the story is if you know the, these these two people and and how they affect everyone else around them because of you know their sincere love. Andy, let's uh, let's talk a bit about the uh, the film itself and and the visual look of the film. What? Uh, how did you? sort of chart that out and, and you have camera angles that are from a great heights and, and low camera angles, you mix it all up and just the overall visual feel of the film. Yeah, I, I started off by thinking this is really uh, a mixture of Diving Bell in the Butterfly and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, actually. <laughs> and that was, that was my starting point as a sort of... Uh, <laughs> I'm joking, of course. I'm not joking, actually. Um, there's something about the, 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 the Heath Robinsonian approach to life that these guys had. That, again, going back to the pioneering aspect, um, it, that, that making life up as you're going along with always two minutes away from death seemed to me you know, a key element. I was also very, very inspired by, um, by the film um, Man on Wire and the relationship between Philip Petit, who, uh, who obviously you know, strung the wire up between the, tw the two towers, um, with the help of this incredible group of, of eccentric friends who loved him. And he was almost like a mess messianic figure at the center of, of, these, of this cabal of people who enabled him to do that. So th those, th and then, uh, so there's that. Then there's, there was a sort of t rather Tintin-esque um, approach to the palette of the film, uh, which was, again, very purposeful. Um, because because this, this group... We, we, you know, the vi again, going back to the vibrancy of their existence, the essence of Robin and Diana was not drab in any sense. It was not mur murky or grey or somber. It was bright. They burned bright, and I wanted to make it um, to feel like that in there, in you know, from from the first frame of the shot to the last. And so everything about this film, although the uh, the, the all aspects of, of of the story are absolutely authentic and true and uh, happened, um, we 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 took license, and I took license with elevating it and and slightly lifting it so that it had with Bob Richardson, amazing Bob Richardson, um, to create this this level this tonal world that it that enabled us to shift between the the, the darkness of the film but but to keep the humor and the levity so that was that there was very much the, the the kind of approach and talk a bit about the soundtrack of the movie one of the uh, things that stands out in the soundtrack of the movie is the constant sound of the ventilator of course uh, being a pace throughout the movie and then there are other uh, parts of the musical score including andrew's saxophone Oh, this Andy. Yeah. But anyway, um, so uh, so Nitin Sawney uh, was was fantastic to work with. He's a very very good dear friend of mine. And what what he was able to do, and again, the music plays into the, the them thematically into into the the. Um, the chitty chitty bang bang of it, you know. We wanted this sort of romantic thing. You, when you go into this movie, that you're watching this beautiful 1960s romantic movie that everybody thinks is going to, uh, you know, it, it, they think they're going to get what they they think basically. Um, and then this event happens, and 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 it, it, obviously life is turned on its head. 
The music had to, and I think it was definitely, I think we found Jonathan and I in the edit, the, one of the most complicated aspects of the movie, because to keep that tonal shift without leading the audience, without, without you know, overstating it, um, with playing it psychologically, have, have Nitin really find the root of what Robin was going through and internally, psychologically, uh, but also a, a thematically about, about love. Those, those, the, and, and, and also a spirit of adventure. We wanted the, the, the sense of adventure all the way through this, that, that these people were living an adventurous life. And so we, we, we came up with that, that sort of spirit of adventure slash kind of love theme at the beginning, which which then is reprised when the wheelchairs all all come out, and uh, you know, and uh, when he goes back and frees all of the other uh, you know inmates of the hospital. Um, so that so that that that, and then actually, crucially, there was one piece of music that Nitin wrote, which was a beautiful piece of music, um, which we five minutes to six on the last day of the mix, so we were just about to, to lock picture and sound we decided to take out and and it was the best decision that we ever did which was the scene where where um robin and diana say that my love my life that that scene which had a beautiful underscoring but actually it didn't need it we wanted to at that point go take everything out pull everything out and just and let these people be and that and that's so that so i think i think there was a great complex nature to the way that we, we, we with knitting you know sculpted that score Great. I'm afraid we're out of time, um, so uh, I'm just going to say that uh, Breathe is a TIFF gala presentation. Um, it will have its uh, theatrical debut across North America on October 13th. Thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thanks, guys.